Hello. In this video, we're going to be talking about an area of SPV3 that we call the cake. We call this area the cake because it consists of three levels of natural terrain that lead up to the assault on the control room's original pyramid. What made this area challenging was that it couldn't just be constructed for use for the end of assault on the control room, which was essentially a tank run which was the more simple of the two tasks, but it also had to be designed to be an on-foot section later in the game for the level 2 betrayals. The first iteration of this area was actually done back in around 2009 and was then shelved until we reevaluated it in 2013. The first iteration was concepted by one of our level designers who wanted to incorporate one of the giant bridges from Gearbox's additional multiplayer maps into a natural terrain area. It was a solid concept. The giant bridge protruding from the ground gave the area a sense of scale and had enough wide open areas that tank combat could be achieved while also having a slight sense of verticality that would make it different than all the other assault in the control room areas of the tank. However, it just kind of existed with no greater purpose. You came out through a tunnel, and then into a tunnel, and that was that. Given the scale of the area and the awe-inspiring nature of this giant structure coming out of the middle of the ground, this area was one that we definitely wanted to revise and include for release in SPV3. The first thing we did when reconstructing this area for SPV3 was trying to maintain consistent player behavior. The original version had areas of this map that were warthog based, on foot based, and then eventually tank based. We decided early on that the previous area the player would come from would definitely have the player in a vehicle, most likely an anti-air wraith or a grizzly tank. However, we also know some of our players like trying vehicle sections on foot, especially when combined with our skulls. So a crash pelican was placed as you enter the area, where we place some alternative weapons and vehicles for the player to use. If the player decided to go on foot, there were sniper rifles and rocket ammo. If the player did not want to use their tank or their tank was too badly damaged to make it through the section a rocket warthog, and gun goose were placed. One of the challenges that posed once we had this area constructed, however, was that we hit the squad limit for Halo 1 on how many AI you can have in a map. We also hit a limit on object names, a problem with Halo 1's garbage collection that meant vehicles earlier in the mission could not be removed and therefore would still emit particles even though they were off screen. So the encounters here could not be as dense as we originally wanted. The original plan was to have the area be symmetrical where you would take the grizzly tank and one of the marines would get in a wraith tank and they would take one route up the mountaintop while you would take the other. However, due to the squad limits, we quickly had to get rid of this idea and had to reconfigure the area. Rather than there be a branch at some point in the level and let the player take one of two paths, it ended up becoming almost like a Z in terms of player movement. This actually ended up being a good thing, because for the other half which the tank could not go on, we could actually construct that area to be an entire ground-based section, which we would then later use in two betrayals where the player would have to traverse this environment down backwards. The last technical challenge we had was making this link up with the original assault in the control room. We didn't want to reconstruct any of the original encounters or cinematics, so this BSP had to be positioned in a place where it would link up where the waterfall would be in the original map. What no one understood at the time we designed this was how bad Halo's precision math could get when you deviate so far away from the center of the map. Not only is this at the end of one of the largest levels in Halo 1, but it had to be located deep underneath too, in order to avoid any intersecting geometry. While I would have liked to do more with this area, I think we ultimately came up with something that was pretty fun, and one of the good side effects of having to limit what we could do was being able to make the gameplay loop more compelling when you're on foot using rockets and a sniper rifle. Overall, I'm pretty happy with how this area came out. It would be nice to have less limits on the AI and be able to have more characters on screen as well as have more allies and vehicles. That would really make this place shine but it's not really within the scope of the engine to do that, especially given the multiple challenges we faced getting this even running in the first place. Where the challenges in Assault in the Control Room were more technical in nature and trying to just get this massive area to run while the player went around in a tank blowing everything up, the challenges for two betrayals were actually the opposite. With the exception of Halo 5, there was no area this big in any Halo game, let alone one that you had to traverse on foot. On top of that, we had three enemy factions to include in this play space. The area also needed to support air combat and air encounters using a vehicle that had never been done yet in Halo CE. The other interesting thing about doing this area for two betrayals was that the player comes from the top down, meaning that once they reach the cliff edge, they can see everything in this big giant canyon. This was neat because the player could see their objective down on the bridge below, which was a banshee to take them up to the first pulse generator. But it also meant that every single encounter on the map had to be viewable once you left the control room pyramid. We didn't want to try to force the player on a set path or suggest to them a certain route to take. 
seeing the entire area laid before them, we wanted players to assess and think about what they wanted to do and be able to tackle the encounters and covenant camps in any way they wanted. But that wasn't enough for us for this area. Given this level's uniqueness as having both the Covenant, the Flood, and the Sentinels, we wanted to take advantage of the Sentinel Enforcers as enemies. Different conditions on each side of the map would trigger the Flood or the Sentinel Enforcers, and was used to make sure that the players could not completely predict the outcome of their actions. This helped maintain the tone and atmosphere of the level, as the player really felt helpless as they were only one small player in this giant battle raging across the ring. We wanted the player to feel alone, afraid, and powerless in this area, in sharp contrast to the kick-ass feelings of the original power trip that you had in the Grizzly Tank. To aid in this, we introduced a whole new variety of Covenant in this mission. The Savage Covenant, as we call them, were Covenant that were so afraid and so desperate to survive against the onslaught of the Flood that they had started to use recovered human weapons. This new change in the status quo of the Covenant combat loop meant that about after 8 hours of playing the game, players were going to be struck by something unpredictable and new that they had to learn how to react to. Eventually, the players would get down to the Banshee and fly it up to the first pulse generator. Then came the second half of this area. A crashed Sparrowhawk lays on the bridge where players would have normally left the area. The player can choose to use their Banshee to take out the Covenant on that bridge and acquire the Sparrowhawk, which is essentially a flying mantis. Or the player can fly immediately over to where the Covenant are guarding the shield door controls so that they can proceed to the next valley. Any remaining Covenant that the player did not kill on their way down to get the Banshee will move into a new position in order to guard the exit of the area. Finally, once the shield door has been disabled, Flood will start swarming into the area from the tunnels below and engage in one final fight with any remaining Covenant that are alive in the area. This is one of the areas I'm most proud of in the entire mod. It encompasses some of the key things that make Halo special to me. Open-ended areas, non-linear encounters, different factions, a sense of exploration and wonder, vehicle combat, and perhaps most importantly, it makes you feel like you're actually traversing this alien environment. The biggest challenge when designing this area was just making sure that there was no way for the player to break the scripts going in some crazy direction or route. It was always a fear of mine that somehow players would find a way to basically avoid every encounter in the area and cheese their way onto the bridge. I am very proud we were able to prevent this while still allowing the player to use stealth to sneak around some of these areas, but still requiring them to combat some of them as they would migrate and move on the player's position. While they will not be engaged in combat all at once, you can have up to 98 AI in this one area alone. As impressive as I find this area to be, I will admit that this area is not very accessible to new players, nor is it very easy. I am not quite ready though to call this a negative for the mission. By this point, the player is already about 8 hours into the game, and they've already been playing the Halo franchise for quite some time if they're checking out this mod. Two Betrayals by nature is a mission that pushes players to their limits, so if we were not to make this mission hard and not to make it challenging for the player, I don't think we'd be doing our job in maintaining consistency with the rest of the level. I also find that your most hardcore fans will enjoy a challenge and enjoy having to think about what they're doing as the status quo has switched. I'm also very happy with the reception people have had to this level. There are many who claim this is their favorite level in the entire campaign. There are other people, though, who do not like it as much. Some who even say it's one of their least favorite in the mod. However, it is not uncommon to have these same people who dislike it at first come back and say they really enjoy it. It's challenging for sure, but I think it's good that when players are invested in the game, they find it rewarding. It's what I think makes good replay value and gets players invested in coming back into the game over and over again. Replayability of the campaign levels is what I view as a tentpole of Halo. There's many other games who have fun campaigns, but they don't really lend themselves to replayability that much. This is probably the most replayable mission in the entire mod that we did. And for that reason, it is my favorite.